Good morning. I'm Gord Long with the Financial Repression Authority. I have James Rickards joining us today. Jim is Chief Global Strategist at the West Shore Funds. He's editor of the Strategic Intelligence, a monthly newsletter, director of the James Rickards Project, and a very well-known author. Welcome, Jim. Thank you, Gordon. Great to be with you. I hope we don't have any technical issues, but I'm going to jump right in. I have up here a... Uh, an agenda of what I want to talk about here today if we have enough time and I know we only have a limited amount of time. Uh, Jim, I want to jump right in on your book. Uh, great book, great title, a little confused on why it's the new case versus the old case. I don't know what's changed. Well, that's a great question, Gordon. We'll uh, get into that. I happen to have a copy of the book with me here. It's called The New Case for Gold. Uh, it's available now on Amazon uh, if, if the viewers are interested. And uh, exactly what's what's new about it? Um, the title itself has some uh, resonance. Um, uh, I can has a little bit of history behind it. I can explain briefly. In 1971, of course, that was the end of the gold standard. And in fact, President Nixon uh, suspended redemption of dollars into gold by our trading partners. Well, come forward to 1980, Ronald Reagan was running for president, and uh, you know the the Nixon suspension was only nine years old at the time. Uh, and there was a lot of sentiment to go back to a gold standard. Uh, it didn't seem that difficult. And President Reagan uh, was under suppression to do that. So what he did, he appointed a high-level bipartisan commission to study the issue with some prominent Americans. This commission came back, did their work, and said they recommended that the U.S. not go on a gold standard. Uh, but as with a lot of these committees, there was a minority that felt strongly the other way that had voted in favor in favor of going back to a gold standard. So they were allowed to write what's called a minority report. This is customary in, in committees of this type. Well, that minority report, of course, was a public record, and uh, some enterprising um, it was public property. So some enterprising publisher took the minority report and published it as a book called The Case for Gold. And the members of that minority report, by the way, included. Ron Paul, Lou Lehrman, a number of other uh, uh, classic uh, sort of uh, uh, supporters of gold. So that book, The Case for Gold, became kind of a cult classic among gold investors, gold aficionados, and so forth. And it's uh, it's still in print. You can still find copies of it. So my book is called The New Case for Gold. So that's a little bit of a tribute to that original uh, manifesto. But uh, specifically what's new about it, some of the arguments have been Going, going back and forth for 50 years, some of them probably uh, 250 years. But there are some, and I talk about those in the book, I talk about some of the big, 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 the arguments against gold a lot of people throw up at you. I explain why they don't hold water, why they're, not, why they're obsolete, why they're inaccurate and not factual, and kind of make it easy for anyone interested in gold to knock them down. But then we go forward from there and, and make the case in favor of gold. But, for example, one of the new 21st century threats, the reason to have gold today, is that right now, today, Vladimir Putin has a 6,000-member cyber brigade operating outside of Moscow night and day to hack, disrupt, destroy, and delete U.S. digital financial records. And I run into, uh, you know, very wealthy individuals, billionaires occasionally, and you say to them, uh, you say, well, I'm a billionaire, and you say, really, what do you have? And they say, well, I have, the, I have these stocks and these bonds and these assets. And I look at them and say, no, you don't. You have electrons. All of that wealth you just described is in digital form. You may get a paper statement from your broker, and that may make you feel warm and fuzzy, but if Putin or the Chinese or the Iranian or the Syrian um, cyber brigades have breached those systems and wipe out those records, you have nothing. Uh, and good luck restoring it. Good luck finding your wealth again. It'll be completely gone. Whereas with physical gold, and I do recommend physical gold, not paper gold, you can't hack it, you can't delete it, you can't erase it. It's actually very hard to physically destroy, believe it or not. It's one of the characteristics of uh, gold is at the atomic level. It, it, it doesn't it doesn't interact or react with other uh, other metals or solvents. Uh, so it, it's a very, very, not only tangible, but solid form of wealth. But more to the point, it's non-digital. And I do recommend investors have uh, some portion of their wealth in, in that, that kind of asset. I'm not saying sell everything and, uh, you know, sell your stocks, take your money out of the bank, go buy gold, uh, 100%. I recommend 10% of investable assets. It still begs the question what you do with the other 90%, but 10% is enough to, uh, it, it's, it's small enough so that gold kind of goes sideways. It's not going to affect your portfolio that much, but it's big enough so that gold goes up multiples, which I do expect. That's your insurance against the rest of your portfolio burning down. But if you don't have some non-digital wealth, you're completely vulnerable to being wiped out. Jimmy, the first one that's articulated as clearly as that. I don't. I think everybody looks at gold as insurance, 
in many fashions, but not quite with the exposure to cyber war and the digital exposure. And I, and I also say, you know, at Financial Repression Authority, we've done a lot of work on assets that we consider either in the banking system or outside the banking system because of potential problems with a crisis threat, ever mind uh, digital cyber warfare. Well, that's, that's a separate issue. You're absolutely right about that, Gordon. By the way. That, that's a separate issue independent of yeah. a malicious attack. Let's just say uh, we had a you know, good old-fashioned financial panic of the kind we had in 2008. So you look at what happened in 2008. Um, the, Fed, the Federal Reserve came in. They printed $4 trillion of money. They did $10 trillion of swap lines with foreign central banks that they could get their hands on dollars. That was not very much discussed at the time. They guaranteed every money market fund in America. They guaranteed every bank deposit in America in conjunction with the FDIC. They basically pulled out all the stops to prop up the system. The problem is that a lot of that support is still in place. The Fed has not normalized their balance sheet. They have not reduced it back to the original $800 billion. They have not normalized interest rates. They're trying, but very conspicuously failing so far. The swap lines are still in place. So what happens the next time there's a financial crisis? And by the way, these things happen every seven, eight, nine years. Like clockwork, go back to 1987, October 1987, the stock market fell 22% in one day, not a week or a month, but one single day. Today, in today's Dow, Dow index terms, that would be the equivalent of a 4,000 point drop. If stocks drop 400 points, it would be front page news, you'd see it on every website. It's all people would talk about. Well, this would be the equivalent of dropping 4,000 points. That happened in October 1987. 1994, Mexican peso crisis. 1998, Asia financial crisis, long-term capital management meltdown. I was involved with that. Mm -hmm. I was that long-term capital manager. We were hours away, just hours away from every stock and bond exchange in the world closing down. It turns out we, we did the bailout to kind of save the day, rescue the system, but it was that close. 2000, the dot-com meltdown. 2007, the mortgage meltdown. 2008, Lehman Brothers, AIG. I mean, people know all these events, but we seem to erase them from their memory pretty quickly. Well, guess what? It's been eight years since the last one. How, how long before the next one? It won't be that long. But the difference, Gordon, is that the next time the Federal Reserve printed $4 trillion the last time, that money is still out there. What are they going to do? Print another $4 trillion? And it was, you're at the outer limit of what they can do. So the next time, it's going to be a very different outcome. Money market funds are going to be frozen. Uh, the SEC issued a new rule. Uh, the Securities Exchange Commission issued a new rule last year saying that money market funds can suspend redemptions. Very few people know this. You probably got a little flyer in your Merrill Lynch statement or whatever. People throw it in the trash. But uh, the next time, people think they can call up their broker, sell units in the money market fund. The money will be in the bank the next day. What they're going to discover is that this money market fund suspend redemptions. Even if you can get the money, your bank is going to reprogram the ATMs to limit you to $300 a day for gas and groceries. In other words, they're not going to bail out the system. They're going to lock down the system. Uh, and again, that's why some gold and, and silver plays a role as well. But some gold or silver uh, will serve you well because those are outside the, the system. So, so you want it for two reasons. One, what we just discussed, which is be outside the regulated banking system because you'd be locked down. Two, be non-digital because uh, the, the digital assets can be erased and wiped out. So those are the two very powerful reasons. These are new reasons. Again, that's why I call it the new case for gold uh, that are part of the debate today. People were not talking about cyber warfare in the 1980s. They were not no. talking about locking down the banking system in the 1990s. These are new arguments in addition to all the old arguments. The old arguments still hold water, which is, you know, protection against inflation, uh, you know, et cetera. But, uh, but the new arguments, I think, are very compelling. And the, and the next crisis, we believe, Financial Repression Authority, won't be nice and neat and tidy like we had in the last one. That is, the Fed could take action. It'll be a global crisis a cri where you, the coordination between central banks, et cetera, is going to be extremely difficult and the problem that much more complex. So being outside the, the banking system um, is something, and I'm not trying to be critical of the banking system, it's just a prudent consideration that's now surfaced. Jim, but following on that, um, we have so many young people that don't even think of gold as money or as a monetary asset. I am an old school guy, I believe it is. Can you shed some light on that concept? Sure, this is the product of uh, about 40 years of uh, either uh, uneducation or miseducation with my uh, my children are millennials. Uh, I know a lot of their friends are millennials. I, I think it's a it's a brilliant uh, entrepreneurial, um, uh, innovative generation with a lot of great ideas. But 
you're sort of only as good as your uh, as your education. You can't blame people about the things they haven't been taught. And the the academic establishment simply stopped talking about gold about forty five years ago. I was yes, actually exactly. going to the last class. I, I uh, got a graduate degree in international economics uh, in the mid nineteen seventies, and I was literally the last class that studied and was taught gold in a monetary context as a monetary asset. You know, everyone thinks we entered the gold standard in 1971. Well, that's when President Nixon suspended redemptions, but the world's kind of muddled through the, the next couple of years. It wasn't until 1974 that the IMF officially demonetized gold as a monetary asset. And that's exactly, 73, 74 is exactly when I was studying it. We had to, we had to you know, read uh, the IMF balance sheet and look at gold reserves, look at individual countries' gold reserves and understand the role of gold in gold the system. So I was taught that, but if you're younger than I am and you know anything about gold, you're either self-taught or you went to mining college because the university <laughs> simply stopped teaching it in an academic context. Now, what the, that's, but it's worse than that, Glenn. Not only did they not teach it, so you wouldn't necessarily have any reason to know anything about gold, but there were six or seven myths about gold. Yes. That were then disseminated and perpetuated by the power elite. And you know, when I say the power elite, I'm not trying to conjure up a boogeyman or a deep dark conspiracy. I mean, these are we know who they are. It's it's you know, Christine Lagarde at the IMF, it's Mario Draghi at the European Central Bank, it's Janet Yellen at the Federal Reserve, it's uh, Marty Feldstein at Harvard University, Larry Summers. I mean, they're they're known people and, and they get together at whether it's Davos or Jackson Hole with the sidelines of the G20, and they talk to each other. By the way, they all know each other because they all went to one of five schools. Now, they either went to MIT, Harvard, Yale, Chicago, or Stanford. They were, in many cases, each other's professors and PhD thesis advisors. This is a really close club, close group of, of, of PhDs who run the international monetary system. They all hate gold because they're in charge of a paper money system, which, you know, if you're in charge of the money, you control the power. You control the politics. You can make or break regimes and presidential candidates. And if you had that power, why would you give it up? They don't. They don't want to. They think they, they know it all. So, so they put out these myths against gold. So what, what are the myths? I talk about them in the book. I take them one by one and knock them down. For example, they'll say that, um, uh, John Maynard Keynes said gold is a barbarous relic. I mean, how many times have you heard that? Keynes actually never said that. He, he used the phrase barbarous relic in relation to a very specific flawed gold exchange standard of the 1920s. He wasn't talking about gold as money. He was talking about a particular monetary arrangement at the time. People will say, well, mining output doesn't grow fast enough to support world growth. You hear that one all the time. Uh, first of all, that's absolutely ridiculous. You can change price. Gold can support world output out of price. You just have to raise the price. But more to the point, that fails to make the distinction between official gold and total gold. Uh, official gold is 35,000 tons, but total gold is about 180,000 tons. If a country wants more gold to expand the money supply, print the money and buy the gold. In other words, there's no mining output has nothing to do with the ability of a country to expand its gold reserves. All you have to do is go buy some of the private gold with printed money if that's what you want to do. So I, I don't have to go, go through them all, Gordon. We don't have time, but uh, of course they're all in the book, but uh, the new case for gold. But my point very simply is that uh, when you look at these arguments against gold, none of them hold water. We knock down every single one of them. And then the arguments for gold, they stopped talking about it four years ago. So is it any surprise that a younger generation knows nothing about it? Uh, Jim, you know, in financial repression, we are we believe that four of the pillars are, one, the, uh, you need inflation rate, and certainly the central banks are targeting inflation, and you need to have negative real rates uh, in there to uh, to achieve financial repression, and I, I know I've I've seen or heard that um, we know the Fed is trying to all the central banks achieve some level of inflation, assuming they were to achieve it, targeting the uh, long end to keep it lower to achieve nominal rates. Youth believed, or I think I heard you say that's when you think gold will really take off, if in fact they do achieve this inflation rate. Well, first of all, Gordon, I agree completely with the two points you made. Uh, the, the Fed needs inflation uh, yes. to basically manage the debt. We have $19 yes. trillion dollars of national debt. Um, you don't have to pay it all off once people say, hey, you're going to pay off the debt. You, you know, we haven't paid off the debt since Andrew Jackson. But you don't have to pay it off. But what you do have to do is make it sustainable. You have to be able to roll it over. And that's a question of, you know, what's the interest rate? Do people have confidence in your ability to pay? Do people have confidence in your ability to manage the economy. I mean, Alexander Hamilton figured that out 200 
you know, 30 years ago. He said, you don't have to pay off the debt. You just have to roll it over. But there comes a time when you're not able to roll it over because people look at the debt to GDP ratio. They look at how much your debt is growing. They look at how much your GDP is growing. They look at, at your debt capacity. They look at interest rates and so forth. And they say, you know what? These numbers don't add up. You're not going to be able to pay off this debt. And that's exactly what happened to Greece. Uh, almost happened to Spain and Italy and some other countries. That's a classic debt crisis. The U.S. is going down that path. You know, everyone in Washington is patting themselves on the back saying, you know, we, we took the deficit from 1.4 trillion in 2010 to about, you know, 400 billion today. That's true. They actually did do that, but, but it's still 3% of GDP and GDP is only growing at 2%. So yeah, the numbers look better, but they're still moving in the wrong direction. The debt is still growing faster than the GDP. And that's the path to Greece. That's the path we're on. Now, how do you get out of that? Well, one way to do it is inflation. You say, okay, I, I can pay 19 trillion, but it won't be real money. It'll only be worth maybe half of that. You know, and inflation is a very insidious thing. The Fed has a target of 2% inflation. It sounds all warm and fuzzy. Yeah, 2%, we can manage that. Well, 2% inflation cuts the value of the dollar in half in 35 years. In another 35 years, at 2%, cuts it in half again, which means in 75 years, which is a normal lifetime from the time you're born to the time you die, say at 75, the, do the value of the dollar goes down 75%. The purchasing power of your money goes down 75% in a normal lifetime. That's with 2% inflation. We're not even talking 3%, 4%, 5%. That's another story entirely. Then your money really disappears uh, uh, faster than you can imagine. So I don't see what's benign about 2%, but that's that's the first trick. The, the problem the Fed's having is they can't even get to 2%. I call this uh, Mick Jagger economics. You know, the Rolling Stones says a song called You Can't Always Get What You Want. Uh, the Fed wants inflation, but they can't get it. The second thing you mentioned is also very important, which is negative interest rates. A negative interest rate is when the interest rate that you pay which is the nominal rate, is lower than inflation. So um, I borrow money at, say, 2%, but inflation is 3%. Well, 2 minus 3 is negative 1. That's a negative interest rate. That means I get to pay the bank back in cheaper money. In other words, it's like the bank's paying me to be a borrower. I remember when I got my first mortgage in 1980, the mortgage was 13%. My mother cried. She, her first mortgage was maybe 3%. Um, and it was 13%. But I said, Mom, inflation is 15%. So my actual real cost of borrowing after inflation is negative two. The bank is paying me to take this loan. So that's that's a very powerful incentive to spending and lending and getting the credit machine going again, getting the economy moving again, et cetera. But the problem is the Fed can't get there either because inflation is so low. Now, this is what's driving negative interest rates. Because So let's say inflation is 1%. How do you get to a negative real rate? We well, have to have interest rates at zero or negative one, right? Because then now the interest rate is lower than inflation. So nominal rates have been chasing, it's a race to the bottom. Nominal rates have been chasing inflation lower and lower. And what happens when inflation turns to deflation? Now the math gets a little tricky, but let's say uh, instead of inflation, you have deflation of negative one. How do you get a negative interest rate, a negative real rate when inflation is negative one? Well, you have to make the nominal rate negative two. So in other words, negative one minus negative, uh, uh, you know, minus negative two is, is plus one. That's your negative real rate. So, so it's it's uh, it's become an impossible task for the banks. They're not getting there. Meanwhile, the debt continues to pile up. Now, here's the point: the Fed has to have inflation. They're not getting it so far. They're not succeeding, but they have to keep trying. This inflation has to come because if it doesn't, they can't pay off the debt. So, I just look at gold and say, you know, what are, what are people waiting for? Get get your gold now at very attractive uh, prices, and you'll be all set when this inflation finally shows up. Jim, you, you, the gold is money, it's monetary, and it's, so it's a currency. You've written a book, a very successful book on currency wars. So what is what are the central banks doing? And you just papered a subject on the G20 meeting recently in Shanghai, and I'd like you to share your findings with that, because I think it's actually profound what you believe uh, really transpired there. Well, thanks, Gordon. The point I make is that... Um, you know, the world is uh, is not always in a currency war, but when we are, they can last for a long time. Uh, they can last 15, 20 years, as I describe in my book. Now, what is it that causes currency wars to, to break out? Well, it's a combination of two things. It's when the world has too much debt and not enough growth. Too much debt, not enough growth. And those two things are related, by the way. The debt overhang impedes growth, so they're not completely uncorrelated. 
So when you have too much debt and not enough growth, how, well, how do, what do you do as a country, as a policymaker? Well, the only way to, to get out from under the debt, well, there are a couple of ways. One is outright default. And it may come to that, but at least so far, no one wants to step up and admit that, hey, I'm just not going to pay you. You know, that's the outright default. The other way is inflation. Uh, but in a, in a debt deleveraging cycle, and uh, we, we also have powerful deflationary trends today, not just debt deleveraging, which I just mentioned, but also demographics and technology. These things are all pushing in the direction of deflation. How do you get off money your debt when you have that much deflation? Well, you need to get some inflation. We talked about monetary policy, which is not working, but the other way to do it is to trash your currency, cheapen yes. your currency, because with a cheaper currency, it increases import prices. So if we weaken the dollar, uh, then the stuff we buy, whether it's you know Chinese manufactured goods, energy imports, iPhones, whatever, all that stuff gets more expensive. That's one way to put inflation into the uh, supply chain. The problem is that not everybody can cheapen their currency at once, right? Because you know, if you have a cheaper euro, a stronger dollar, or if you have a cheaper dollar, you have a stronger euro. It's like a seesaw. Somebody's always up and somebody's always down. All the currencies cannot get cheaper at once. Well, actually, they can against gold. The only way that every currency in the world can get cheaper at the same time is not against each other, but against gold. Because gold is the one form of money that can't fight back. The problem we've had the last seven years is that, you know, in 2009, you had the cheap Chinese yuan. In 2011, you had the cheap dollar. In 2013, with Abenomics, we had the cheap Japanese yen. In 2014, with uh, Draghi's uh, negative interest rates. 2015, with Euro QE, we had the cheap Euro. So all these currencies are taking turns, but they can't all devalue at once. Now, what happened was that in, uh, you know, the, the Chinese, the, in, in 2011, 12, and 13, when you had the cheap dollar and the cheap yen, you had the strong euro, and the Europeans were suffering. They had two recessions in five years. So finally, it was their turn to have a cheap euro in 2015, early 2016. But now the country that was losing out was China. They really wanted to cheapen their currency, and they did last August 2015. Mm -hmm. They had that shock devaluation. But what happened to the world? Where were you on August 31st? It looked like we were staring into the abyss. You know, go back to last August. Maybe you were on vacation. People were taking the kids back to school, whatever. But stock market was imploding because of that Chinese shock devaluation. So the major powers, as I say, they do get together. They get together at these G20 meetings. They get, they'll get together in a few weeks at the IMF Spring Meeting, April 13th in Washington, D.C. G20 always meets on the sidelines of the IMF, so we'll have another one of these uh, sit-downs. Uh, sit-downs of mafia term is when the godfathers all <laughs> sit around the table. So there'll be another sit-down in Washington on April 13th. <clears throat> but the point is, they looked at China and said, okay, we understand that you need a weaker currency. It's kind of your turn. My, my analogy here, Gordon, is like, Five soldiers fighting a battle. It's a really hot day. They're thirsty and they've got one canteen for the five soldiers. What do you do? Well, you pass the canteen. Was, everybody wants to drink the whole thing. We know that. But you take a sip and you hand it to your buddy and he takes a sip and hands it to the next guy. And that person takes a sip. So that's what's going on with the currency wars. You yes, can't only buy it once. You have to take turns. So uh, it was most recently Europe's turn in 2014, 2015. Now it's China's turn. But there's a catch. How do you weaken the yen without causing stock markets to crash? Because that's what happened in August. So what they decided to do is say, okay, instead, hey, China, instead of you doing a shock devaluation, why don't we hold the dollar kind of steady and we'll raise the euro and the yen? And that way you're cheaper because China has big trading relationships in with Asia you? and big trading relationships with Europe, yep. better actually than the United States. So we'll do a backdoor devaluation. We'll keep the Everyone looks at dollar, yuan, that's the Chinese currency. So here's the yuan, here's the dollar. Everybody, let's keep that about the same. So it doesn't look like you're devaluing. But we'll raise the euro and raise the yen, which Draghi and Corona did, and that actually weakens the Chinese yuan. So it was a backdoor devaluation of the yuan, and there was a continuation of that um, as recently as this uh, speech that Janet Yellen gave to the New York Economic Club on March 29th, where she said um, it was a very, very dovish uh uh, speech, the complete opposite of what she did last December. And she turned on the dime. It's almost like somebody got to her, you know. I don't know whether it was Bob Rubin or Lil Brainerd or, or you know, uh, Larry Summers. Maybe all three of them ganged up on her. But somebody, she more or less abandoned the playbook that she wrote in December and gave this very dumbish statement. But it was clearly not to do with the U.S. economy. It was to do with China. 
Um, so by keeping the dollar weak, China can keep their currency weak without breaking the peg. So that kind of, uh, that's the code, that's breaking the code of the international monetary system. But the point is, Gordon, it shows you how manipulated this is. It shows you how fragile it is. And if I'm looking at a monetary system that's that manipulated and that fragile, I do not trust the ability of those central banks. I don't care how many IQ points they have. I don't care how many PhD points they have. They're going to run this thing off the road. And that's when you're going to want gold. You know, it was, it really, we really saw it in all the meetings after the Shanghai G20 meeting uh, from Dahi, as you mentioned, Yellen, from Kuroda, who changed expectations. They may have not changed policy, but they reset expectations, which effectively put upward pressure on the yen and put upward pressure on the on the euro uh, to support your point of your point. So it's unfolding. This is comparable potentially to the Plaza Accord we had. In, what was that? 1985 of of true significance here. But I think it is. I, th I think it goes back to the Plaza Accord with one big difference, Gordon. Uh, and you make a good point. But the Plaza Accord, first of all, we had some real leadership. It wasn't leadership from central bankers. It was leadership from finance ministers mm -hmm. or Tre Secretary of the Treasury, um, James Baker at the time. So they were saying, you know, you central bankers, okay, maybe we'll talk to you. But it's really the countries, the finance. So there was some very strong political leadership. I don't see that political leadership today. What I see are bunch of eggheads, uh, candidly, a bunch of PhDs running the world. The politicians are kind of spineless. They're, they're saying, okay, let the central bankers worry about it so we, the politicians, don't have to make hard decisions. Well, that's fine, except somebody does have to make hard decisions. And I would actually prefer if there was political leadership rather than PhDs. I've had, you know, I was um, I was a partner in long-term capital management. That was the hedge fund that blew up in 1998. We had 16 PhDs on our Risk Management Committee. They, they obviously almost destroyed the world, so uh, it shows you what PhDs really know about risk. But we had a former vice chairman of the Federal Reserve. We had two Nobel Prize winners. We had the, basically the fathers of modern financial theory. I mean, these weren't just run-of-the-mill PhDs. These were the people who kind of created the world that we live in uh, to a very great extent, Harvard professors, MIT professors. So I saw that firsthand. I, sh I shared an office with Myron Scholes, you know, co-author really? of the Black Scholes Options yes. Pricing Theory for six years. Um, so I, I was knee deep or uh, neck deep is probably a better way to put it in that world. Um, I've had many conversations since then. But I've spoken to members of the Board of Governors, Regional Reserve Bank Presidents. I've talked one on one with Ben Bernanke, uh, his right hand, uh, in a separate conversation. So I'm, I'm very immersed in that world, and I know how they think. And I, they're not dumb. I mean, they're 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 genius IQs. They've got the credentials, but they've got the wrong models, they've got the wrong worldview, and they don't have the political chops. And so your analogy of the Plaza Accord, yes, uh, an accord to try to rig the global uh, exchange rate system, international monetary system, I agree with that. But the difference is, A, there's no transparency. Because of the Plaza Accord, there were cameras. I mean, we know, when they all went into a room, they said, okay, we're going to change the system, and here's the new deal. There was transparency. We didn't see that in Shanghai at the G20. The, the public agenda was completely divorced from what was going on behind closed doors. And that'll be true again in Washington on April 13th. So we don't, we didn't have the political leadership. We didn't have the transparency. We've left it to the eggheads. You know, shame on us for letting the system get to where it is, but that, that is where it is. And uh, I really don't have any, uh, I, I don't have our confidence in, and it's not a partisan issue. We had leadership from James Baker under the Republicans. We had leadership from Robert Rubin uh, under the Democrats. Uh, so this goes back to the Reagan, Bush, and first Bush and Clinton administrations, which was, you know, whatever you think of their politics, that was a long period of price stability and rel relatively good economic prosperity with only one fairly mild recession coming in there in 1990. Uh, but we don't have any kind of leadership like that today. So I think the, the, the PhDs uh, will continue to try to, to rig the system, but I'm certain they will fail. I've seen that up close and, and personal, so to speak. And I want to get my gold now before they wreck the system. Jim, last question for you. Clearly, at least I feel, we feel financial pressure. There's a monetary reset coming sometime in, in the future. What right. role will gold play if that happens? And do you see it happening? Well, first of all, I definitely see it happening. Now, the um, you know, we talked earlier about the currency wars, and a lot of times people ask me, uh, when, how do currency wars end and when do they end? Well, they, the, one of the problems is they go on for a long time, but they, they end in one of two ways. Um, either there's systemic collapse or systemic reform. So either the, the system just grows and grows and then it falls in on itself and collapses and then there's monetary chaos for a couple of years and then the major powers get together and they, they reboot the system. 
that's one way. The other way is systemic reform when they, they do the same thing, but instead of waiting for it to collapse, they actually do it proactively and prevent the collapse. So, so you know, example of the first would be, uh, you know, 1914 on the brink of World War One. the system. You know, the New York Stock Exchange was closed for five months in 1914. Can you imagine that today? They closed mm-hmm. the New York Stock Exchange. It's closed for five months, you know, next to... Uh, next to the summer, they reopen it. That's what happened in 1914. 1933, every bank in the United States was closed for eight days by executive order of the president. Boom, banks are closed. They call it bank holiday, nice euphemism, but they closed the banks. These things have happened over and over again through U.S. history. So one, and we talked about that a little bit earlier with reprogramming the ATMs and freezing the money market funds. That is what's going to happen the next time. So that's one scenario. The other scenario is more like the Plaza Court Convention, which is, hey, the system's a mess. It's a little incoherent. Why don't we all sit down around a table and uh, and reform it in, in ways that, that work better? Um, so it'll, it'll be one or the other. My view is that the collapse is much more likely because, of, well, for, I mean, the collapse is inevitable if you don't do anything, but through a lack of, poli- a lack of political leadership, a lack of understanding, they're not going to be proactive the way they were in 1985. They are going to allow the, the system to collapse. Now, when you say, what role will gold play? Gold will absolutely play a role. This is why China is acquiring thousands of tons. Russia is acquiring thousands of tons. Iran, Turkey, all these countries are, are acquiring gold. Because think of it as, as that these monetary resets, Gordon, it, think of it as a poker game. Five or six people sit down around the table uh, to play poker. Well, what do you want when you sit down at the poker table? You want a big pile of chips. Well, in this system, gold is going to be the chips because it will be the only thing that everybody trusts. If you're in a currency war, you know, euros, dollars, yen, you want world printing all these fiat currencies. They're all going to be sub, they're all going to be suspects. They're all going to be, uh, and by the way, these other, our trading partners want to get out from under the dollar hegemony because we abuse it all the time with, you know, uh, fines on the banks and economic sanctions and freezing the Iranian accounts. Why do they want to be in dollars if we keep using it as a, as a military or a political tool? So the, the paper currencies will be suspect. Gold is always money good. This is why the Chinese are buying it. This is why the Russians are buying it. I want to buy some too for the same reason. I tell people it's good enough for the Chinese. It's good enough for me to be those guys aren't dumb. Um, that's one scenario. The other, the collapse scenario, however, uh, the gold will be even more urgent because it'll be the only thing that, that people will trust. There's not one central bank in the world that wants a gold standard. I think that's clear. But they may have to go to a gold standard whether they like it or not to restore confidence because it's one thing that always restores confidence. That begs another question, which is, okay, if gold is going to have a role in the new monetary system, either uh, a strict gold standard, which you know, may or may not happen, or some reference to gold, or gold is going to matter in terms of your money supply, etc., what does the price of gold have to be for that to work? And this comes back to this criticism, there's not enough gold in the system to have a gold standard. Well, that's nonsense. There's always enough gold. It's just a question of price. And I've done the math on that. It's pretty simple. You just look at the gold supply, look at the money supply, decide how much backing do I want? Do I want 20% gold, 40% gold, 100% gold? You've got to answer a few input questions like that. But once you do on some reasonable assumptions, I took global M1 with 40% backing. I think that's reasonable. You could do global M2 with 100% backing. There are other ways to do it, but the range, depending on those assumptions, is from $10,000 an ounce at the low end Fifty thousand dollars an ounce at the high end. I think ten thousand dollars is a, uh, a reasonable estimate. But that's what gold would have to be to avoid deflation, to avoid a depression. Because a lower price of gold means you have to reduce the paper money supply to maintain the parity. Well, reducing the money supply is depressionary. Everyone knows that. So if you're going to keep the money supply out there and you're going to back it with gold, you're going to have to raise the price of gold. So that's where, when I talk about a $10,000 price target for gold, it's not a number I made up. I'm not trying to get a headline or, you know, spook people. It's just eighth grade math. It's what the price of gold would have to be. And again, I explain uh, all of this in my book, The New Case for Gold. Um, it's available on Amazon now. And it, it, we go into it in a lot of detail. So I hope the readers, uh, hope the readers enjoy it. Jim, uh, any last comments you'd like to leave with our viewers? And how can they order the book, which will be available on April the 5th, right? Right. Uh, the book's available now. Um, the, the official publication date is able to okay. you, you can pre-order it, or um, you know, obviously it'll be available thereafter. Uh, Amazon, you know, uh, beginning April fifth, you can get it at your local bookseller. But uh, now or any time thereafter, you can order from Amazon. Um, so it, it's widely available. It's uh, 
it's a little shorter than my other books. It's the kind of book you can get through in an evening, a couple hours with your feet up in an easy chair. Uh, but we make it, um, it's very straightforward. It has some history, it has some economics, it has some politics. But, uh, but we take people, first we shoot down the arguments against gold, show why they don't hold water. And then we give you the arguments for gold, both the old ones and the new ones that we talked about earlier. So, uh, and I wrote it because in my first two books, Currency Wars and The Death of Money, each of them had a, you know, Currency Wars had a chapter on gold, The Death of Money had two chapters on gold. But I got to a point where I said, you know, I have to stop writing a chapter here and a chapter there. Why don't I write a whole book, put everything in one place, make it easy for, you, for people to access. Jim, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Really enjoyed your comments, and I know our viewers will too. We have to have you back in the future. Thank you, Gordon. Hope so. Thank you. Bye-bye.